Morning, members. And I will start by doing the bit I always forget. <laughs> right? The fire alarm will be loud enough, you will hear it. And if it does happen, please leave. It's not, it's not a test run. There's all the rest of the bits that you know anyway. The route out, there's a fire escape door, which has got fire exit written on it. And you're supposed to go to the front lawn. Don't jump in the lift, because you might be stuck there. And don't come back until you're told if there's a fire. Right. I've actually used it, Judy. She keeps, keeps putting it in front of me, but I don't always get round to doing what I should do with it. Um, and members, welcome to meeting of the Exmoor National Park Authority of Tuesday, the 1st of November. And we will move straight to item one. Apologies for absence. I've had one, uh, Francis Nicholson. And otherwise, I believe we have a full compliment. To move on to item two, any declarations of interest? And I'll start that end. Anyone with any declarations of interest items on the agenda? Great. Thank you very much. And any lobbying? No. <laughs> no hands anywhere? My chairperson's announcements. I don't know what I've done with the bit of paper I'm supposed to be looking at there. Don't think so. As far as I'm aware, have I got anything specific I'm supposed to announce? I don't think so today. Hmm? No. I thought we anything that we will discuss will be either in the agenda items or briefly afterwards. Move on to the minutes, item four. To approve as a correct record, minutes of the September meeting. Thank you, Mike. Seconder. Thank you, Vivian. All those in favour? Thank you very much. That was all those that were present. <laughs> um, and now, as, as is the norm, we will move on to consider the minutes, the, any matters arising from those minutes, page by page basis. Page one, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Thank you very much indeed. No matters arising from those minutes. Public speaking will be taken in relation to the item to which it relates. And I believe the public speakers today are around the planning items which Stephen Pugsley will deal with. Move on to item six. The allocation of legacy funding. And ask Rob Wilson North to join us. Rob. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members. The, uh, this item I, I will take you through very briefly. Um, we discussed this at Members' Forum um, just around a month ago, <coughs> and it relates to um, the allocation of some of the legacy funding that we were given by two individuals um, just a little over a year ago. Um, and the recommend recommendation of the paper is that we approve the allocation of £300,000 of legacy funding in support of a bid to the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, we are at the stage with the National Lottery Heritage Fund, fund of being uh, invited to make a full application. We've, we've, we've given them an expression of interest, um, which is a, a very short document of 800 words, and the process that then follows is you are invited or not invited to make an application. We've been invited to make an application. So we don't have the funding, it's not guaranteed, um, but what we felt was appropriate was to come to you at this point and ask for formal approval for our match against the lottery bid of that, that cash sum of 300,000. Obviously, if the, bid doesn't, if the bid gets turned down, then we'll be back to square one in terms of that legacy funding, and we will come to you with other proposals. But at this stage, the direction of travel is that we would use that 300,000 to lever in around a million pounds from the lottery 
Um, I had a meeting with them last week. It, it was formerly 900,000, but they seem quite relaxed about that going up. Um, so we're looking to, what we think is maximise the value of that, that 300,000 to bring in around an extra million. So a £1.3 million programme we would be looking to do. Um, and that that is focused on the landscape of the former Royal Forest. So if you like, Simmons Bath and its environs, environs and the way I've described it as, it, to people uh, is as, if you, if you think of from Brendan Common to, to Molland pretty well, it's that sort of chunk of Western Exmoor, uh, the old Royal Forest landscape. The intention of the programme is to deliver nature recovery and heritage conservation projects across that landscape. Um, it will also address issues around appropriate skills for nurturing the landscape. So we'll be looking at asking for funding for intern, internships and volunteering opportunities. It will also in address sort of new audiences, so trying to draw in new audiences into that landscape. And it will also um, tackle one of the, the biggest issues, I think, is, which is the lack of information and interpretation of that place and the history of that place. What is it that makes that place so remarkable? Um, and we, we imagine doing that in, in ways that uh, won't clutter the landscape with signs and interpretation boards. It will be done very much as a digital thing um, and through events and activities. So that's those, that's those are the kind of areas of focus. Um, the time scale is that we will aim to put a bid in, subject to your decision today, we will aim to put a bid into the lottery within the next couple of weeks, and we will hear from them um, by April, or by the end of March, I think. Um, and on the basis of that, we will secure development funding if they, if they like it, and next year we will carry out development works, which is sort of proof of concept, trial activities, that sort of thing. Um, and then based on that, the, the application is resubmitted at the end of next year, and thereafter there will be a delivery phase, and that will be around four years. So it will run from, say, April 2024 to probably April 2028, something like that. So it's a four-year program. program. If you, if you think about 1.2 million or so spread over four years, that is not a lot of money. Um, in, uh, we're talking a lot about money at the moment, but it's not a lot of money. Um, so um, it is, it is a, I would say, a well-funded but relatively modest program, um, but we think it ensures the maximum value we can get for that legacy if we're successful. I think that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Rob. Jeremy. May I move approval? Thank you. Thank you very much. Vivian? Was that, yeah. oh, it was Jeremy. No? Anyone, would anyone like to speak on that at all? Evelyn might do. I have a feeling. Just congratulations to Rob and his team for getting this far mm. in a very competitive scheme. And once you have the development phase under your belt, then I think it will be a smooth run forward. So let's... You know, we've had a proposal. It's been seconded. I hope everyone can support it. The development funding is very important because that will enable you to identify any potential future costs, and particularly um, revenue costs going forward. Um, from the capital spend, and I think that's very, very important. But also, there will be provision for monitoring so that you'll be able to um, <coughs> illustrate to both us and the lottery that this project is sustainable. That's going to be the key. So, congratulations, and I'm very happy to support it. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah, I would, I would echo those thoughts. Congratulations to Rob and his team for getting this far. I think I also just like to sort of highlight the fact that in, from my, my perspective, being, looking at being able to leverage the legacy funding to do this amount of work gives us a potentially a really good PR approach to, um, 
to highlight the value. Should anyone else feel like they would like to leave a legacy to the Exmoor National Park Authority, we would attempt to leverage in a, in a similar manner to ensure really good value for money that, rather than just spending the legacy at the base level. So, Eric? <coughs> yeah, um, just to exercise Rob's mind, looking forward five years, what, how do you, you think this money is going to change the landscape we're talking about in this area? I think, uh, as I sort of alluded to, I think 1.2 million isn't transformation, and if that's what we wanted to achieve, and I'm not saying it is, I think what it does is it lays down well, it lays down exemplary projects. That's, that's the intention. So to demonstrate how you can do nature recovery, how you can do heritage conservation. So you achieve those, those projects, but you, it shows the way. So it's like a beacon, if you like. It shows how these things can be done. And so the timing is not lost on us. This will be at a time when hopefully we'll be clearer about Elm. Hopefully it will have started by then <laughs> um, as we start on the ground. So it might actually work alongside some of the Elm Elm funding um, and, and there may be there may be synergy there in terms of, uh, of, of the, the schemes as well in terms of long-term legacy I think I, I would be absolutely honest with you I think um, for some programs like this the legacy is very short but um, dare I say it I think I, th I think that if it achieves great things in the short term it can influence people's behavior and that would be part of the idea of this so that in, through nature recovery, and we're already doing it, so we've got projects like Sow the Seeds, which is influencing how people behave. You know, they, they're interested, they, they want to engage in projects like that. They, they believe in grass in, in grass and restoration, meadow restoration, that sort of thing. So I think it's, it's about showing the way, um, and certainly in terms of some of our ambitions around woodland creation in some of the coombs in the old royal forest, um, the way we're doing it, the way we propose to do it is innovative, it's harder work, it takes longer, but actually it shows it can be done in that way. No, I, I ask the question because I can envisage, although you don't get your know, pub talk, Skittles League, like you used to, where a lot of gossip moves around, but uh, I could simply envisage talk of 1.3 million towards development in the Simmons Bath area <coughs> to see the new town there. That's, that's the thing. That, locals will proceed initially? I, I, well, my, my, my feeling is that if, we, if the, the lottery has the, has the liberty to spend its money where it likes, if we can persuade them to spend it on Exmoor, then I think that's a good thing for Exmoor. Uh, definitely, a, definitely a bonus. <laughs> so let's that's, that's, hope it's successful. I have proposed in a seconder. Um, all those in favour? That is unanimous, Judy. Thank you very much, members, and we will look forward to reports on progress, Rob. And we will move on to item seven. Nas membership of National Parks England, and over to Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, members. Um, this is a paper which um, sets out progress with working with National Parks England uh, and where we are in terms of uh, movement on the, the subscriptions. And in this paper, we're asking you to confirm resignation from MPE. So you remember back in December last year, um, we agreed uh, that subject to, to those changes being made on MPE subscriptions, unless that happened, uh, we would withdraw. We sent notice back in um, March. We paid our of 15,000, which takes us through to Christmas, which is, is, is what's set out in the memorandums. Um, at the same time, Broad's authority also withdrew. In light of those two um, actions, MPE set up a small task and finish group to look at alternative subscriptions. It came to, uh, it, it, it set out in the paper, there are a number of options which were looked at, um, and the favoured option was this banded approach, whereby the small parks, like New Forest, Northumberland and Exmoor, would pay 17000 with the larger parks paying substantially more. 
Since that time, I can just update you because we've had the paper from MPE. Their board meeting is later this week. Um, it's very similar, but it's gone up a little bit. So we would be in the 18,000 bracket, uh, 18,500 next year. While we welcome, you know, the reduced subscription, it's... It just doesn't go far enough, I think, members. I think we would be looking at a substantially reduced subscription were, were I to recommend you to go back in. And this is particularly at a time for us when we've got huge financial issues to face. And for a small park, 18,000, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. And we do recognise all the work that MP has done, um, particularly around things like securing funding on the carbon audits and the, and the collaboration and so on. So it's you know, it's with reluctance and with a heavy heart, but I don't think we have any alternative than to, to confirm our resignation. We did meet with DEFRA yesterday, and we discussed this very briefly. Um, DEFRA is now moving towards setting up its National um, Landscape and Trails Partnership. Um, it did, DEFRA did reassure us that we would still remain part of that discussion and would have a, a place there, even if we were out of MPE. Thank you. Members, uh, John first. <coughs> yes, it's very sad, isn't it? But it's kind of um, a symptom of the starvation of the public sector of finance that, that sort of add-on organisations like this get starved yeah. first. And as the report says, even, even any of the options in the report still leave MPE unsustainable and living off their, their fat effectively, they're living off their reserves so they're reducing their reserves every year so it cannot continue and it will and no doubt be further increases in subscriptions for everybody including us in the future and the options to us really seem to be to either employ someone to do something useful here or to give the money to MPE to talk to a revolving door of uh, yeah. secretaries of state as, as they come and go. I mean, what is today? So it, it seems to me that, that um, I'd like to move the recommendation. Thank you, John. Susan. Yeah, um, yeah I would um, second that and just build on, I think, what John said. I think the last point for me in 4.6 of Sarah's paper um, saying da, 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 the fact that MP has not been able to make the case for realistic levels of core funding for MPAs is, and I think that's a really kind of important point in all of this because obviously they have done some good things but you know there was a at the National Parks Conference there was quite a discussion about you know you, we need us, you, us, the parks need to be at the table um, more and to be making a better case and I think that on some level comes down to basically the, the way that the natural world is, is, is perceived within um, governance models but the fact that, you know, MP hasn't managed to, if, if it was doing that job and really managed to advocate for and pushing DEFRA, then I might feel differently. But um, although it has done some good stuff in bringing some money for projects, as Sarah says, I just feel that, um, that they're not pulling enough weight in a time when we have to think about where our resources go. And also the level of, you know, if they were talking about maybe five five thousand pounds subscription, I might think differently. Mm. But it's not really that different. And it'll go back up against 20 within a year. The, uh, with the second proposal. Thank you, Susan. Andrea. Uh, thank you, Robin. And um, actually, I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on paragraph 4.6. So I do think that when we get back to MPE, so can we make it very clear that should a new model emerge, which is more collaborative, hosted in a national park and um, focused on outcomes rather than just an organisation running for itself, then we'd be very interested in doing that. And I, I would even go as far as say, I think we'd be very interested in even helping to set that up. Some of us have had a lot of experience doing this elsewhere. Um, and I think that, again, a different model where we know what the outcomes are wanted by DEFRA, after all, we are just an agent of DEFRA, yeah. whether we like it or not, that's what we are. Um, what, when we know what the outcomes they want, then I think that we can come up with a focused group for all of the national parks where we can then go to DEF for asking for the money for specific projects. And that's how slim, slim line it needs to be going in the future. We should be far more agile than this old model. Thank you, Andrea. Any other members?
I, I would agree with the comment made by Andrea, absolutely there. You know, I think we have to recognise this is a really changing world, um, as John alluded to, the sort of the revolving door of, of, of government at the moment means that uh, any, any real certainty of direction is uncertain. And I think we have to keep a door open there that, yes, to work collaboratively is important. And I think I would highlight the fact that whatever the decision, I would anticipate that I would still want to work with the other national parks and with DEFRA. Just because you're not doing it through a specific model at the moment does not mean to say that you don't talk to each other and work with each other. So, John. If it's okay with Susan, I'm happy to include the gist of Andrea's remarks in, in um, my motion. Yeah. Yep. That would be great. Thank you, John. At which point I will move to the vote then. Um, I have a proposer and a seconder together with amendments as stated by Andrea included in, in those remarks there. So I, I'll better get the wording right recommended, the authority is recommended to confirm its resignation from National Parks England. Um, those in favour? I think we have a unanimous vote there, Judy. Thank you very much, members, and I will pass on those, and I will also ensure that those comments, as made by Andrea, are passed on as well in discussion with them. We will move on to item 8. A revised budget for 2022-23, which is, of course, wonderful. Bear, Gordon's a bearer of great news currently with this sort of thing, unless he's actually got to the bottom of a rainbow at the moment. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, hand over to you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So we, at the revised budget, we, we look at the midpoint from the year and we look at how expenditure and income are arising to see if the assumptions that we set at the start of the year um, are holding true. So if I can talk you through the paper that's here. Section 1 details some of the key themes when we set the budget for this year um, and when we um, close the accounts for 21-22. It also just reminds members of, of where we've come in the last few years with the National Park Grant in terms of where it's been cash limited for. So some of the key themes within this revised budget are finding the money for the, um, the, the staff pay award, which is higher than we budgeted. We budgeted at 2%, but as it's looking increasingly likely that the, that the fixed amount will be given to staff, um, that equates to a, a percentage increases, which is more than we budgeted. So we've had to find some additional funding there. And also there's some additional funds for the external consultants in the planning service and also for the fixed-term conservation officer. So that's section two. Section three and appendix one reviews the core budget. So this shows on a service basis how the budgets have moved between um, revised and the original budget. And as stated, the key principle here in terms of how budgets are moved um, relate to the, 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 the pay award. 3.4 mentions that there has also been um, three vacancies um, in year and, and the processes which we're going through in terms of filling those. Um, and 3.5 mentions the, the fact that there are some significant legal costs arising in year, so we will be using the legal contingency reserve, or possibly all of the legal contingency reserve, in meeting these costs. Section 4 and Appendix 2 details the programmes, partnerships and contributions to reserves. Um, so one of the key issues when we, when we set this budget was we set aside money for driver farm, and we're in the process of... Um, undertaking surveys and speaking to people in terms of how some of that work could be con um, um, undertaken. Section 5 and Appendix 3 um, shows our use of reserves, um, our position, our reserves position and also some of the capital spend um, in the year. There's only one small transfer between reserves which I'm asking members to agree to. Um, so the, the small underspend on the Simmons Bath Project Development Reserve being transferred to Ashcombe Gardens Reserve. Um, members will also note that two other reserves have now um, been, been completed, their objectives have been met, so the Dunster Action Plan Reserves and the County Gate Reserves will be closed at the end of the year, all being well. Um, in terms of some progress on capital schemes, 
the rest of um, Section 5 um, details the spend um, on the Environmental Resilience Reserve, um, the completion of schemes within car parks, um, and it also mentions some of the challenges we're currently experiencing with the Pinkery Decarbonisation Scheme. Um, yes, and importantly in 5.5, this notes the receipt of a new grant to improve accessibility within parks, which the Access and Recreation Manager is developing schemes to, to spend in here. So we are, we are asking members to approve that receipt of that grant. It doesn't come with significant obligations, it just has to be spent in line with the scheme. Section 6 looks forward. Um, this isn't a usual part of the revised budget, but obviously the, the situation is evolving and there's um, pressures that are arising in year. So it has become more important to, with, when we look at the revised budget to sort of take a look forward as well. Um, so when we set the budget, there were small but achievable savings. So we had a balanced budget for this year and there were small but achievable savings for the next two financial years. Obviously because the, we have notification of a three-year National Park Grant freeze and because inflation um, is much, much higher than was anticipated when the budget was set, um, these, these savings targets have increased. So leadership team and staff have begun a process um, at re-looking at the services that we deliver. So 6.5 details the public steps that will be undertaken in setting a balanced budget for the next few financial years in terms of some of the key tasks that will be undertaken by, by the authority. Section 6 and Section 6.6, um, as previously mentioned, this gives us the opportunity to formally state what the underlying principles will be um, of, this, of, the, of the service restructure that we're looking at currently. So you'll notice that that's structured across key principles and supporting themes. These won't be new to you, but I think it's important um, that we're evidencing publicly the consideration and the process by which we're going through in terms of the, um, the prioritisation process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Members, Evelyn. Chairman, I was interested to um, find out whether it's possible to set up some kind of reserve for the historic pension contributions so that they're not part of our annual budgeting. Well, they are, they are an annual cost. So yeah. it makes sense to budget for them annually because we have to meet the costs annually. So if we were to meet it differently, then it would be to use one-off amounts of money to try and reduce the deficit. So if we did have half a million pounds or, or more lying around, then theoretically we could look to meet that deficit in a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, Some of them are really quite old, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Well, there's... there's, there's the people. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are various elements within our budget. So there yeah. are, within the service budgets, there are elements from, from staff that, that retired possibly um, 20 years ago yeah. um, or, more, or more, so we're still paying those elements. But yeah. then the, there's the actual deficit as well, which is a combination of e existing staff and previous, and previous staff. Thank you, Gordon. Any other questions, members? Mike. Okay. Well, Chair, I think this is a work in progress, very clearly. Um, I'm not sure there's a great deal we can do other than to move the approval of all the recommendations set out in the report. Thank you very Which much, I'd Mike. I'd be happy to do. Andrea? Uh, well, I'd like to second that, um, but equally, I think that we really do need to get out our messages in 6.6 .6 out to say, somehow, so the public are aware that we have refocused. Um, there's a bit of a warning that Please don't come to us talking about buses or all the other things that we don't do, education and housing and all those things, because we're not doing those. And, and this is a relevant authority, but I think that message we do need to start getting out there somehow. So I'll, I'll leave that with the Chief Executive to think of how we start sharing messages. Thank I'm happy to second it. Sorry, I was going to say that. No, thank you. I think that is important. There's an awful lot of talk and supposition at the moment, but I think to have some clear messages like those principles there really, really would be very useful, wouldn't they? Jeremy. I was just going to ask whether that, that paragraph can, can be um, publicised to parish councils and people like that who will be meeting very shortly. Is, is that something that the National Park would like to be spread around now? Well, in reality, this is a public meeting. Yeah. This meeting is public recorded. These agenda minutes are public. So what's in these papers is for public 
consumption as such, Jeremy. Would you, your thoughts, Gordon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we obviously we're, we're between, we don't have a communications officer at the minute, but they are joining us in the next few yeah, days and weeks. Sense. Yeah, we've, we are, I think Caroline starts next week, so we've got a new communications officer, and her, one of her first tasks is going to be this. There's obviously some wider messages that need to go, not just to our local communities, but, you know, to the community of, you know, southwest England, basically, about what the cuts are going to look like and what it's going to mean. Not in detail, obviously, but uh, I think, you know, the public needs to know um, what's going on. <laughs> Thank you. Dominic. Yeah, le leading on from that, really, I was on a meeting last night, an online meeting with a campaign for national parks. Lots of people on there, lots of different NGOs, lots of people interested in national parks, lots of organisations like the Exmoor Society and their equivalents in other national parks. So a lot of people you'd think would know, really know about national parks. And a lot of it came down to a list of all the things that authorities like us ought to be doing, but we're not. And I had to put a put in there and go, yeah, but that's fine, but do you realise the resource restraint we were under already, and now the one we're about to be under, and really there's very little idea about it. It's quite interesting. And so that's amongst an informed group. So I would say, then spread it out to people that are less informed than that, and you really do, I think, have this huge information gap. And I think a misunderstanding as well about the fact that this, for instance, the graph that we saw recently, which I think everyone should see, which is basically when Gordon did, you know, with the, with the look, this is real terms drop in funding. What it would in real terms now be about seven million, and now this is sort of three-ish, um, is absolutely fundamental because those, those are political decisions. You know, this isn't something that was done to us by Putin. This is a political a series of decisions, and the public need to be aware that these are the consequences of those decisions. We're not being political, we're not making any judgments about that, but you need to lay it out with those facts. And I think that's something that we should... And, I, and you're right, these, these are public documents we're producing today, but, I mean, how many people genuinely read those, interested members of the public? So I think I agree that it is a communication challenge, but I really think we need to be basically getting that message out a lot more than we are. Thank you. Yes, I think I would absolutely agree with you, Dominic. Thank you. Susan? Yeah, I'd just come in and yeah, very much support that. And I think, you know, it's, it is a bit of an opportunity, you know, as an opportunity as well to be, as Andrew said, you know, people think, you know, I have the same problem up in Loch Lomond, they think that, you know, that, that National Park does transport, they think it does these things. And I know there's always, you're never going to get it perfect, you're never going to be able to, everybody who absolutely understands what we do and don't do. But I think it is, you know, I think I really welcome having these really clear principles, I think it's really helpful, and, but it is opportunity in terms of our comms to actually be able to say a little bit about where these other key areas do lie and where those responsibilities are from other, where they are other, yeah. you know, which obviously... I think we should, that's an opportunity to do that as well, to have clarity about what our key role is, what we're really here to do, what the fundamental purpose is, and then other organisations, how we work in partnership, but we don't lead and are not responsible for these other things, you know, just to give some balance. Thank you, Susan. I think it is, I think it is important, and I absolutely, absolutely agree that actually getting that message out now to people, and it's not just to the general public, I would agree with Dominic, I'm afraid that organisations as such are still in a situation where they appear to be forever wanting to promise more without any recognition of how they're actually going to do it. And I think there's a reality check needed there. And let's, let's get people on side. Rather than promising what we can't do, let's promise what we can. Evelyn. Yes, Chairman, would it be worth us having key briefing notes once a month so that we can get those messages out when we're meeting people and discussing EMPA. If we have a new comms officer, that's a good time to start with a new kind of discipline, but we just need those key messages spelled out to us so that we can weave them into our discussions. I think I really hope Good idea. Can. Yep, we'll take yeah. that on board, most definitely. Jeremy. <coughs> thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to say thank you to, and I'm sure we're I'm speaking on behalf of everyone. Thank you for getting on with it. It is reassuring to me that we are making this progress quickly and have a clear view of where we're going. Um, so I'd just say thank you for, for that. And agree with everything that's been said otherwise, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So no other questions for Gordon? We'll move 
We've had a, I've had a proposal and a seconder, haven't I? Yes, early on. <laughs> Which I didn't write down, that was my mistake. Uh, we have five recommendations there. Um, and I think probably with the, with the addition of the fact that to ensure that our messaging of those key principles, Gordon, is, is dealt with appropriately to ensure the public understand the direction of travel here fully. Um, all those, Nick? Just, just a quick one, really, is that can we make certain if we put it out a message, it's very clear and basic, because even just reading here, the National Park Authority exists to deliver national park purposes to further the purposes of designation. Now, as, you know, to read that from a, a, a sort of a, a, a point of view, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't say anything. In fact, if anything, it's management speak to say I'm not doing so at all. <laughs> so we will need make to sure that message is clear and bullet pointed and precise exactly what you're actually <coughs> meaning. Thank right, you. point taken, Nick. Thank you very much. And we'll make sure that that is, um, that is addressed. Jeremy. Just to underline this, I just wonder whether it's front page news for Park Life next year. Yeah. There's a thought. I'll leave that to Sarah and mm. Gordon to have a discussion. Okay. It may well be with the comms, yeah. comms officer there. I think we will need to do a clear explanation of what the National Park is actually doing, Jeremy, yeah. in the future, to dispel an awful lot of the myths that have probably grown over the years. Yeah. And at least that might give a better understanding. So I think, yeah, yeah that may be quite a useful thought there. Um, we'll move to the vote. So... All those in favour of the recommendations. Thank you. That is unanimous, Judy. Thank you very much, members. And thank you, Gordon. You're still there, aren't you, for the next bit, Gordon? And we will move on to item nine, the Treasury Mid Management Man Treasury Management Mid Year Report. Yours, Gordon. Thank you, Chair. So we are obliged to look at Treasury Management three times a year. Um, once when we set the policy, then at the end of the year in terms of whether we complied with it, but also mid-year. Um, so there's no sort of important messages to, to, to stress to members here. We are compliant with, our, with the Treasury Management policy that was agreed in, in February and March. Um, we are complying with our potential code indicators. I suppose the only point to, to draw your attention to is the fact that interest is ticking up. Um, so for, if, if there is a, a silver lining um, in an inflationary environment, it does mean that you know, we are getting a greater return on our cash balances. So you know, we could be getting, uh, and there's a suggestion that for next year's budget, we could be budgeting as high as 4% for our, for our cash balances. So that will, you know, if there is any um, you know, rabbit that I can pull out of a hat you know, in, <laughs> in setting the budget for next year, it's probably going to be... Rabbit, <laughs> yeah. So that's the, that's the one outside. So, so those, are the, those are the key messages, but nothing, nothing other than that to report to the authority. Mike Ellicott. I propose we accept the re uh, vote for the recommendation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And a seconder. Thank you, Evelyn. Any questions of Gordon on this report? In which case, all those in favour of the recommendation? <laughs> and that is unanimous <laughs> thank you thank you very much Gordon and we'll move on to item break. 10 two minute break while we wait we, for Dan to come yes we can we'll, we'll need a two minute break because we're a little bit ahead of time and uh, Dan James hasn't yet arrived so we'll give him a minute or two to go to Lou, refresh their coffee. I wonder whether at forum we should mention
Right, members. And we will restart the authority meeting. Please. And um, I will hand over for item 10, I do believe it is. Report of the UK National Parks. UK National Parks. We're down. Over to you, Dan. Morning, members. I'm not anticipating on speaking much at all. You've got a report in front of you. Um, but yeah, just to kind of highlight, obviously, well, two months ago now, uh, just over a month ago, we posted. I thought it was on. <laughs> um, apologies. Yeah, so we, we hosted the UK National Parks Conference at the end of September. Um, the first time we've done it since about 2020, 2000, I think so. Um, it seems to have come around fairly early, but anyway, there you go. Um, one of the things that we did was took a very proactive decision right at the beginning to change the format. This was partly predicated really just on the practicalities, but we were keen to host it within the National Park rather than going outside of the borders. Um, and of course, we just don't have the kind of bigger conference venues that you'd require to run a traditional conference within the park. So that partly predicated it, but also the change in format was really just designed to kind of shake things up a little bit, um, bring it a bit more down to earth, a bit more authentic, provide some more time for networking, um, and also to have a study to us to give people the opportunity to really find out what's happening on the ground. Um, so that kind of predicated the changes in the program, and we were also very keen to ensure that the cost was not exuberant, um, and I hopefully you'll be pleased to note that it's been very much cost neutral to the authority. Um, we managed to secure additional sponsorship, which covered most of the costs alongside the delegate fees, including a small contribution towards the staff time involved in putting on such an event. Um, so other than saying a massive thank you to everybody that was involved, I didn't really want to say anything else. We have got a film. Some of you may have already seen it. Um, we were going to do the short film, but given that you're so well ahead of time, we're going to go for a slightly longer film, um, just to, and that hopefully will give those of you that weren't able to participate in it fully a, a bit of an overview, really, of the key themes that came out of it, and then happy to take any questions after. The UK National Parks Conference is an ideal opportunity to bring 15 national parks spread across the UK together. Each of the national parks is unique, but by coming together, we can be inspired and go away empowered to do great things in our national parks. Our theme is, what does the nation need from national parks today? But it's really an opportunity to, to consider where we're going, how we are relevant to the future, and what we need to do differently. We are gathering here to be excited and enthralled and, and energized. The national parks are a gift to everybody. And there are some really exciting speakers who are going to talk about some of the work that's being done to make sure that everyone and anyone on these glorious green aisles has got every opportunity to get out there and enjoy these gems. So I really hope that everybody who participates not only comes away with new ideas, but gets to tell everybody else what they have seen and what they're excited by. I want to welcome you to Exmoor. We'll explore issues we face as a nation, and we ask Exmoor and the whole family of national parks, how can we tackle the big challenges we face? This is an opportunity, I think, to focus on our future. I think we've got to ask, our national park purposes, that is our statutory purposes, they're relevant, and I think they're probably more relevant now than ever before. Put together. There's still not yet enough collective ambition to match the immense public desire to protect and restore nature and beauty. And the things I want people to think about are how you can work together across the landscape movement for big common national goals whilst retaining local identity, autonomy. But what we're missing is that big connected ambition for the things that these national places can do for the nation. And that's more important than ever. In the review, I was always saying it's more for nature and more for people. It's unashamedly ambitious. And we can do that in national parks. So bringing people together, realising that they seriously matter. National parks were set up in the 1940s to serve the nation after the war, not just as local bodies. So meetings like this are essential in forming that connection. Tonight we were here to talk about Revere and how the national parks can work together to create real change. In the last 18 months we've been piloting new ideas and new ways 
to understand the market for natural capital restoration and how we can leverage private finance to be part of the solution. There are young people out there who are desperate to take action and who ultimately want a green career. National parks are perfectly placed to do this. We were lucky enough to be a part of Generation Green, but it was a very short time scale and it's over now. What are national parks going to do to continue this work? It can, it can seem like there's never any time to go and actually visit some of these incredible wild spaces, but just making a little bit of time can open a door to, to change your life, really. The nation needs a world where the conversation is not about how do we get you here, but is shifted to how can we get more people like us here. The key themes of what I'm going to be talking about are going to be around hard and soft barriers. The outdoors should reflect what society looks like as a whole, and at the moment it doesn't. Some of the officers actually working in the parks, they're super passionate about what they're doing, they're really doing great outreach and working with local community groups, which is really, really important. The barriers are things like funding, uh, strategy, and making sure that it is a part of the overall work that is prioritised. The outside just, just refreshes you. It enables you to have those conversations that you can't necessarily have when you're sat watching PowerPoint. The study tours component is a really great idea. I think they're going to be you know, great fun and a great opportunity to just to see more of Exmoor, which is just such a beautiful place. For us, this is really important just in terms of actually the future of national parks and how we can keep encouraging more people to enjoy them and to enjoy them sensibly. We are here in the, the very heart of Exmoor. Um, and we've been learning a lot about the heritage. So we've really sort of come in and, and seen how there's a lot of transformation happening to bring more people into the park um, and to also make sure that the park is working for the local community. It's such a great opportunity. I really want to, to meet people from different park authorities, find out what they're doing, what's relevant to them, what are the current challenges for them. Um, and what does that mean for Scotland? This particular tour, I think, is the most diverse of the tours. We get to, um, we get to go on a little bit of a walk and um, see the rivers, the valleys, and then we go to see the, the Exmoor ponies um, and you know, understand a little bit about some of the, the way they're managing people interacting with invasive species. So this is a direct experience and then talking and learning. I think it's the perfect way to, to do a conference. So our study tour was managing change. We learnt a lot about how the National Trust engaged with the local community, but also the kind of challenges that they faced, especially when coming and interacting with the planning system. And we had a big, long discussion at the end of, like, what can we do as planning authorities to kind of streamline that process and be a little bit more informed about these new nature-based solutions that are coming. We were taken out on electric bikes off into the biggest patch of woodland that's still on the coast, um, I think in, Igl in England, um, some incredible temperate rainforest really. A few words, I'd say fast, lots of speed, um, beautiful, so incredible vistas and scenes out across the coast and history. I mean this study tour is really about prosperity and people and places, which is about how the National Park Authority reacts and interacts with the business community and I've just been really impressed. Working with businesses as uh, perhaps a, a rural housing enabler works with housing uh, associations to actually just say to them we're here, we're the National Park Authority, we want to be part of your success. It, to me it's been roots up, it's not been top down and any successful initiative or initiatives is about that and I just see great examples of that. Yes. We share the same problems we share the same opportunities. I think together is better. And for us to have a stronger voice centrally is certainly something that we've got to do, not only to share best practice, but to speak up for these special mm. places. Yeah. Tonight is about people joining together, enjoying really good food in a really informal atmosphere outside. I think it's a wonderful opportunity that they chose a more unique <laughs> and unusual venue, but also somewhere that is really passionate about food and farming. I believe that we can create something that is going to mitigate climate change, 
like rebuild biodiversity and I think we're all capable of it. We are a lighting manufacturer and so a way for us to counter what we're doing in terms of the carbon um, released into the atmosphere is carbon offsetting and we're achieving that um, with tree planting schemes, land management um, on Exmoor. If everybody can work together collaboratively, I think it will make it much more successful and much more efficient in getting to the end goal. My communities look at the National Park completely different to what tourism do, to people who are engaged with the National Parks, and obviously then people looking at climate change and the position we can play with that. They're all different. What we have to do is look to the future. People and place need to be together. And for me, that doesn't matter where you are in the country. I think one of the key issues is actually encouraging the younger generation to understand the national parks and actually to get involved in them. You've got to embrace the local community, but in our park we've only got 2,000 residents. So actually the people that we're addressing live outside the park but come to use it and we've got to make sure that we can reach them with our messages. Morning. We've got a really uh, interesting morning planned for you. you know, one of the things that really, I think, uh, is a problem is the extent to which all of these issues get polarised. What we finish up doing is having arguments along the lines of, well, obviously it's food, not nature. Well, obviously it's protecting the green belt, not housing. Well, obviously it's maintaining the beautiful view, not the wind turbines. And that kind of polarisation, it wastes time and in the end doesn't make the progress that we need, which is about integrating all of these things into the same land. And the national parks now are even more important because we have this huge job of nature recovery, climate change, as well as at the same time addressing what you might consider to be the third emergency, which is the well-being of the population. And if you put all these things together, then the role of the national parks literally could not be more important. The only way we're going to be able to deal with that massive set of issues is to be working together. And amongst the most important partnerships of all that we see are those with the national parks. The majority of the world's people don't live in protected areas. The majority of the world's people will never visit a protected area, even though everyone benefits from them. For me, national parks is simply one of humanity's very best ideas. Particularly what I'd like to see more from, from national parks doing is thinking about their urban, na urban na neighbours. You know, so how could the South Downs National Park team up with London to get Londoners even more engaged with protecting nature? What about the Breckens and Cardiff? Or what about Glasgow teaming up with Loch Lomond and the Trussocks? What incredible partnerships they could be. Um, and I think there's just so much that urban people can learn from national parks, not just by being in them, but thinking about how they can be inspired by them within their own gardens, their own lives, wherever they live. I was thinking about a metaphorical pen of a future minister who could be hovering over the national parks funding. My challenge to the national parks is, if that did happen, if the worst happened, who's going out to bat for you? Is it young people? Is it urban people? Is it people from marginalised communities? Is it the sort of people who might have more traction with a future minister or secretary of state? This idea you know, of the early people who they were jailed for walking on other people's land because they felt that the people who contributed to Britain's prosperity had an absolute right to enjoy those incomparable landscapes. It's up to national parks to engage and be at those tables where those conversations are happening. Earth, as she's talking about, and some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, but it is the people who continue to try and put a rift between conservationists, environmentalists and farmers. And my overriding thoughts to you today will be we cannot allow that to happen. This is here in Exmoor the most amazing place and the opportunity to create I guess new trades effectively on water on biodiversity on carbon um, that really will deliver investment back into the land within the park farming has evolved as have the national parks and you know they are living breathing productive communities here and the park will continue to evolve but without the farmers it will be a very different landscape. So that's probably my biggest take home message. It's been amazing, really inspiring because we've heard from so many incredible innovative speakers. We are more relevant, I think, than we've ever been before. What it's given me is that confidence that what you're doing really matters, really counts.
Anything you'd like to add to that? No, I, I don't think so. So just a massive thank you really for everybody. I think, you know, we've had some really good feedback. You'll see a summary of that in the report. But I think, you know, our, our goal was really to bring it down to earth, but to make it useful um, and enjoyable. And I think the feedback suggests that we achieved that. So thank you to everybody. Christine. Yeah, I think probably on behalf of us all, thank all the staff for all the extra work that they've put in over a long period of time, and it all worked. I didn't hear anybody complain, moan, or grumble about anything. I think it showed Dunster in a fantastic light. The Tide Barn has never had a more... Um, well, people will know about it and what opportunities there are in Dunster to have a conference at, I would like to think, a reasonable cost so that people could come here again in different circumstances to this. But again, it's just a, a real use of what we have to offer on Exmoor. So I have thanked... Uh, some of the staff individually, but I think, you know, they've done incredible piece of work, and I think we're all, I feel very proud of what they've achieved, so thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Christine. Linda? Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to congratulations. Especially, c congratulations especially to, to all the staff, but especially Dan, who I believe was coping with the chicken pox outbreak. <laughs> <laughs> suffering from no sleep at all during the actual conference period. I, I wasn't there the whole time, um, but I, the people I met, we had, I had excellent feedback. Um, and, yeah, the aberration for, from my field trip for what the staff are achieving in all the on-the-ground projects is, is just amazing. I, I thought I had a fairly good idea of the projects that were happening, but there was quite a lot that I learned from that tour, and it was really great. Conference was great, particularly as it was cross-neutral to the park, but I've got a couple of points. These conferences are a showcase to those who are already converted, aren't they? I mean, the film hopefully will get a little bit out to the community. And I'm hoping that we are, we having told everybody that how wonderful XMO is, come up with those things and got general agreement that there will be something positive nationally. The working together that, that will come from it. But also, partly in, in view of the comment we had on an earlier item about getting more information out about the park and what we do. I mean, I think what I came away with was you, you just get so enthused. You see the wonderful landscape despite some torrential rain on my trip. But some glorious sunshine. You hear about these fabulous uh, projects. We met some really enthused people who were doing great things. And we inspired, I don't know how many were there, 100 and whatever people at the conference. Could we do cost neutral, I know it's a difficult time, something similar and get 100 ambassadors on Exmoor who get really enthused and could go out and talk to their friends and neighbours and build up some of that excitement and vibe that I felt at, at that conference. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Yes, definitely very good point, there, and I think looking on how build on the experience we've had is an important part of what, what we've got there and what we've done. Eric and then Evelyn. Uh, yeah, um, Linda's comment about cost neutral I think is very relevant. You know, to be able to do that is quite an achievement because my mer memory serves me right. I think the, the last Parks Conference was Yorkshire Dales. Yeah. Previous to that was South Downs, which would be about five years ago. I do remember that they lavished 50 grand <coughs> on that event. Um, yeah, I can still picture the banquet scene now. Which, uh, that's another <laughs> <story>. <laughs> So, so that was very, um, obviously their situation is completely different. Um, and on the panel, you managed to, to unpick your panel, because in that instance they had a quite extrovert young guy in his 20s from the Lake District, whose open remarks was that the National Park membership is too dominated by grey-haired males, and he was going to introduce a cow. Um, which made people sit up right from the start, but you didn't have nothing as extrovert as that. Um, it's interesting, for instance, watching the film, 
the, the guy, Chris France, appeared at Tower Tower. You'd, <laughs> you'd think he, he gave the impression he knew something about Axe so <laughs> where, where, where he got that from, I am not got a clue. But yeah, the, the overall concept of how, because the platitudes were quite um, plentiful talking to people. Um, it was along the lines, it, the simplicity of it, but yet the effectiveness of it. So, whoever idea the concept was, you know, deserves some sort of um, congratulations. I'm looking at the chief exec, but she's not <laughs> responding. Team effort. Right. I think um, just on that, I know when we travelled back from the Dales, I think it was, uh, and there were several people in this room and Francis, and we we kind of thought through then we could we could do things a little bit differently, a bit more embedded in the community, get rid of some of the you know the things that were there that didn't seem to have a great reason to be there. So we we pared everything back and talked a lot about boots and mud and fields and uh, that's what we ended up with so yeah very much a team effort Eric thanks Sarah Evelyn just to say I felt very privileged to be part of the planning team it was great to see our officers in action and the various decisions that were made early on that I think were pivotal to making sure that we broke the stranglehold of these very expensive conferences mm, yeah. that don't necessarily bring anything to the party. But what was key, I think, was it didn't feel as if it was done on the shoestring. It felt right for the time. It, um, everyone I, and I was lucky to be there for the whole conference, and I probably spoke to 100 people but everyone was raving, waxing lyrical about the way it was structured. And Dan and team, I think, huge congratulations because it worked very well for the times that we're in, but also would work very well in future. We don't need these lavish conferences that actually don't concentrate on the issues in hand. So, you know, well done to everyone. And thank you for letting me be there. Thank you, Evelyn. Dominic. Mike. Oh, sorry, Mike. Dominic. Um, yeah, echo everything that's been said. Uh, I think we ought to uh, thank the sponsors as well. Um, excellent, good speak, uh, speech from, Def, um, from Dexter as well. Um, I suppose the only thing is, did the conference and the main messages and particular people such as Tony Juniper spoke very well, I thought, uh, and also the, the guerrilla geographer was very interesting. So there were some, some highlights in terms of the, uh, the last day in particular that I attended. Were the main messages sort of confirming that what we're doing as an authority uh, is all right and it's being echoed and reflected by other authorities? Or did it perhaps in addition suggest some other shifts in emphasis and changes in our strategy that came out of that conference? So are we taking back anything new from the conference ourselves? I certainly would think it confirmed what we were doing and those main messages, but were there any other points coming from the conference that suggest to ourselves that there might be some shifts in emphasis in what we're doing, reprioritization? That's a question to think about, but we would then learn as an authority from that conference that we held. Anything immediate spring to mind, Sarah? The most obvious, and right off the top of my head, the most obvious was the need for that national voice, wasn't it? That that we're all doing great things, we're just not getting the traction with government or the public and the recognition because we don't have a strong enough national voice. And there's lots and lots of reasons for that. Um, so that's probably the biggest one for me. I mean, I think always when when you invite speakers from other organisations, they always tell you to do more, don't they? So you're great, but do more. Do more for people in cities. Do more on this agenda. Do more on that agenda. Um, which we've somehow got to embrace and say, yes, we can deliver this, but we need the resource to do it. So it's a, it's a complex one. Dan, did you have any kind of takeaways? No, to be honest, I think that really was the, the key one, was that kind of united voice that, yeah, there was so much good going on. And, you know, you compare us to other kind of kindred bodies and our voice is just not heard at the moment. So mm. I think that, that was the overriding 
kind of thing. And I think, you know, there was a very um, kind of clear decision was made at the beginning that this was going to be more of an internal kind of focused workshop, if you like, rather than a kind of flag raving conference. But there were plans, and I think there still are, from the likes of National Parks Partnerships to look at doing more of that kind of outward looking um, conference where we can kind of share with the world what we're doing. Whereas this is more a case of us looking at ourselves, I guess, a bit more and hearing from those outside of the family, but us having that time to kind of consider. And I think, you know, Claire and I were kind of mulling over that it would be useful for us to kind of go through the key findings and actually think, what does it mean for us as a National Park Authority on our own as well as collectively? Yeah, go on, Claire. Yeah, I think it's really important that we, you know, we do kind of make the most of the conference and and think about what it, you know, what it means for us. And one of the um, things that came out of it, particularly for me, was around the equality, diversity, inclusion agenda, which we had some really excellent speakers on. Um, because we're looking to do that work anyway, um, I think it's given us a really useful kind of. Um, uh, leg up to, to some of that work and, and actually um, already we've made some contacts now that we're using we are talking with Rob earlier about the lottery um, bid um, and we're going to be meeting with some of those contacts tomorrow to talk about how actually we can work with some of those communities to bring in um, to, to that to that work so I think it, it was highlighted in the film that you know it's something that we want to be um, doing across all of the work that we do um, and here we are kind of helping um, make those um, those partnerships to, to actually implement that so so I think you know there's some really practical things that are already coming out of the conference that we can actually um, start to take forward Thanks, Claire. Yes, uh, thank you Claire yes I mean it would be too easy just to walk away from the conference saying yes it went extremely well and it confirms that what we're doing is all all good uh, but we ought to be listening to what was coming out of that conference. It was meant to be, um, it was open to other national parks. They've got something to say as well as all these speakers. So if we're learning from that and taking messages from it, I think that's really helpful to do so. And, you know, I'm sure that is the case, but it's worth making the point. Thank you. Dominic first, and then I can try Eric. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, a couple of things. One about that issue of national voice. Uh, again, I'm, and I'm probably still also thinking about this meeting I was on yesterday, which, which has some of the same people on it. Uh, Sarah Mukherjee was also one of the speakers <coughs> there uh, and said similar things. I think she said it was slightly more... Um, she was a bit more explicit on the meeting last night, I think, than she was in, in a meeting at the National Parks Conference, but that was actually quite useful. Um, I think what we saw in recent weeks was a, was a government, or a prime minister anyway, pretty much brought down, one, by the financial markets, but secondly, by a coalition of what we call the green NGOs, uh, particularly the RSPB, Wildlife Trust, uh, National Trust. Um, and everyone in the papers were talking about the great power of these 15 million members that, you know, when riled and threatened, are suddenly going to have their voices heard. And now, on the call last night, what it was very, made very plain to me was that, that we're not part of that voice. They do not see us as an ally. And that's really critical. In fact, they see us as part of the problem. Um, they see national parks and national park authorities as part of the threat to nature, as not engaging with nature recovery. And that's, that, was, that was hard to hear. Um, and I was sort of trying to kind of put in there and go, well, hang on a minute, you know, we've got a nature recovery scheme, we're doing this, this and this. Not enough, not enough, not enough. So um, we are outside that group at the moment. And I think that's one thing to think about, is how can we basically get back in there? Um, and the other thing, which is more practical point something can take forward, was about this idea of the urban links that the um, uh, guerrilla geographer was talking about, Dan Raven Anderson, because in fact he, came, he, he was touching on something that in our Equality, Diversity, Inclusion group a while back we had been discussing, which is how could we, for instance, and this is just an idea, we need to find funding for it, obviously, um, is identify uh, um, uh, deprived areas, for instance, let's take Bristol as an example, um, which are losing their local parks, where Exmoor could effectively, funded by a donor, come in and essentially adopt urban parks, adopt those urban parks, brand them Exmoor, put in you know, uh, signage and, in, and basically information about Exmoor, and this is why coming to Exmoor, we can actually use timber for our own sawmill, for actually creating installations in these parks, we could actually bring in our own saplings, we could actually do tree recovery and nature recovery in those parks, we could link it with our youth groups to actually come in and we could actually have youth exchanges with local schools in parts of Bristol um, and then youth exchanges with, school, with schools over here. 
Um, I think that's something a donor would be very interested in. But it would, rather than us waiting, because this is the thing that came on the call last night, why are we always waiting for people to come to us? You know, we need to get in there. Exmoor needs to have more of a presence in urban areas, which I think was what Raven Anderson was talking about. And, and I'd say what was great after that meeting, as I think it was Sophie and one other, we had a little chat afterwards. We said, hang on a minute, that was our idea. So we were, we were already ahead of this in our EDI group, which is, so that's really exciting because it shows that we've got officers here that are already on the case with this. We're ahead of the thinking. The trouble at the moment is, is how do we convert that thinking you know, into action and strategy, which is what, what Mike was saying. And that's something we really do now need to push forward. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dominic. Yeah, can't, can't help but agree with your thinking there. And I think, uh, I think we've got to use, use what lessons we learn from this to make sure we adopt the right practices. This is gonna be, it's going to be part of our business review planning as well. Let's focus the resources we've got on doing the stuff that's most valuable and it's going to be the hardest hitting. And it's actually part of our national park purposes because I think it's been easy to be diverted and probably spread too thinly in recent years trying to do everything and please everyone, whereas actually we need to focus a lot more on what we need to do properly. Eric? Yeah, um, so, something far more simplistic than Dominic just set out, but M Mike here raised the issue of national recognition. I think Sarah did before. You know, the, the parks is just overall national recognition of the countrywide what they're doing. I suspect that it would be quite feasible, I'm thinking of how um, Minette Batters on behalf of the NFU pops up everywhere these days. You know, whether it be question time, news programs, uh, Radio 4, early mornings, wherever it might be. I, I suspect a figurehead like that, representing the National Parks Organisation, could more than earn their money. Um, it's only an idea. Um, I guess Sarah will be looking for a step up at, at some point. How about <laughs> it, Sarah? <laughs> you, you, see, you see how... Minette Batters, um, mm -hmm. she's raised the profile of the NFU probably tenfold since she's been there. Yeah. Um, that's the type of person I'm thinking of. We have had them in the past. We've had Caroline Quentin, we've had, I can think of three or four, I can't remember all of their names, who did exactly that, and I'm wondering why we don't have anybody at the moment. So I'm going to take that away. Thank you, Eric. Any other questions? Jeremy? Just a, a remark, I wasn't involved directly myself with the conference, which seems to be wonderful, but perhaps can we take from the National Park Conference what we were talking about earlier, with the pending demise of National Parks England, how are we going to take forward this National Parks Forum then, that is going to do some of these things we're just talking about, and raise our profile, and, and one more thing, Chairman, if we're going to go out uh, uh, into urban areas and take over parks and put our main plate up. Are we doing it on our own as a park or are we doing it with the rest of the park or both? Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Any comments, Sarah? I think on the collaboration and the national working, there's an awful lot going on around discussing what the new National Landscape Trails Partnership is going to be and look like. So we're obviously going to be closely involved with that. We've also got NELAP, the, you know, the Natural England Landscape Advisory Panel, which I sit on. Um, in terms of the, the going out to the cities, I think it's a brilliant idea, and I think it does lend itself to something along the lines of you know, the Generation Green. It's that type of a program, isn't it? It's where we work with other partners, whether that's other cities or other organisations, and put big funding packages together, find donors, whatever. So I think that's exciting. I think at the moment... Um, I mean, generally, there is so much uncertainty, isn't there? This, it's all over the place. But um, you're right, the collaboration definitely does need to happen at that national level. And I think, you know, DEFRA does recognise that. There are uncertainties around the UK comms unit, but, but people are aware and are aware that there is a need to do more. Yes, of course. I, I think, great, fantastic. Um, there are other organisations, as I've mentioned before, Forestry England, doing things in national parks that 
look very similar to things that we should be doing or are doing. Um, mm. You know, there there is, like I say, there's a lot going on out there. Somehow we've got to bring that together. I think we're at a pivotal point in getting it right now. Perhaps is really important. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Christine. Yeah, I just want to come back to that. Thank you. Uh, just thinking about the community, and um, we don't need to perhaps go as far as Bristol. With now the unitary coming forward, we've got Taunton, we've got Bridgewater on our doorstep. There are children in those areas that have never heard of it. So I think we just need to be confident. We're doing what we're doing and keeping going despite the difficulties, despite the finances. We will stick at the job and do what we can in the meantime. But don't worry too much you're going far, far away. We can do stuff on our doorsteps and that needs to be done. Bridgewater is not, you know, the strongest place for parks and gardens. Neither is Taunton. They've got some good places in Taunton, but not that many, and they've got a lot of pressure. So maybe we can think a little bit more about local as well as farther afield. And maybe through the, well, as I said, through the unitary situation, we'll have more input or could have more input into areas at a reasonable cost because we don't have spare cash. This is all about community work, isn't it, really? Yeah. And working with our community. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Well, quite a selection of comments there. I'll just add one or two. One or two, actually. The sort of, I had an awful lot of people, I would expect the visitor footprint to be up a little bit in the future. I think I had an awful lot of people that were at the conference said to me, didn't realise Axmoor was like this, we're going to have to come back and stay again. Which was quite indicative of the fact, one, what we've got here is great, and the other is, we don't sell it well enough. Which is a, a double-edged bit to it, really. Um, on the other hand, I don't know whether we want to sell it too well, do you want everyone to know? <laughs> there's that real challenge, there's that balance, isn't there, to make it, to make it right. Um, so there's, there's some potential benefits there. I think we've also got to remember that when the conference was put together, there was a very, very definite decision made, wasn't there, that this would be to share thinking between the national parks so that each park understood what, you know, a chance to talk, a chan chance to sit down with other people, understand what they were doing, what was going on, show off what we're doing and what's good about Exmoor, but that actually that outward-facing thing is something that needs to be done somewhere different that gets people in from outside rather than internally, and that this was more of that, that, that first step in that direction. And there'll need to be quite a lot of discussion uh, with, with, with other parks, with other organisations, to be able to pull together something that highlights the value of national parks. And I think we've got quite a challenge in the relatively near future to have that discussion and see what can be done there. It's quite an opportunity, but it will be a challenge to find the right place, the right people, the right concept to be able to sell what we want to and ensure that what we're doing is highlighting the value of national parks, not the value of those people that we might invite to come and speak there, because that's the, probably the principal difference. Um, I think the other bit that was around the comments was highlighted to me around the Exmoor side, and I think this is something we probably have got quite an advantage over an awful lot of people, was several people said to me how <coughs> they notice the links to the community in, in Exmoor. I think probably that was principally kicked off by the fact that we ended up having a conference that became part of the community in Dunster, because you weren't in one place isolated from everyone that was there. You actually had to walk through the village to get there. You stayed in different places. There were in different pubs and hotels and, rest and, and, and tea people disappearing into different tea rooms for a chat. And that was a huge value. In reality, as a national park, we can't work in isolation unless we work as part of the community. And with them working with us, what we're likely to achieve is pretty minimal. And I think that's quite an important one to remember. And finally, from me, I, I felt supremely privileged to be chair at the time that we had the opportunity to host this on Exmoor. And my thanks realistically have to go to that staff team that put it together. And uh, I can't thank them enough. I think everyone 
within the National Park staff actually contributed a huge amount. But of course you've got to highlight one or two, and I just will record at the meeting really. I've obviously got to highlight Jan's contribution. Um, how he found time to do that, especially during the week that it happened, his, uh, his daughter was really ill. And I rather hope she's well on the way to recovery now, Dan. Um, I suspect Dan probably had virtually no sleep during the course of that week at all, although uh, he didn't admit that at the time. There was, of course, Katrina, Claire and Judy in the background principally. Judy always does an awful lot, but hides away and pretends she doesn't do it at all, really. Um, and I think that, that gave us the opportunity to highlight to all the other national parks that <coughs> can be done on a really limited budget in a, actually what's a very special place. So thank you very much. To go back to the item, recommendation was the authority to note this report. So, so can we change that please? It's in the habit that we also want to formally thank the staff that, were, that worked, went the extra mile to make it such a success. Thank you. Yes, I think we do need to put that in there. And I'm happy to propose that. Thank you, Andrew. Seconded, Evelyn. And all those in favour? Thank you very much indeed, as expected. <laughs> that was everyone. Thank you, Dan, very much. That was very much appreciated. And uh, we'll try not to land you with quite a bigger body of work again in the near future. <laughs> right, members. We will move on. Item 11, the Exmoor Parish and, or Consultative and Parish Forum. Mike. Yes. Um, the biggest problem we had was people finding the venue. <laughs> there were several guests that did arrive eventually, um, but got lost in, the, in transit, shall we say. But it was a pity because they missed one of the main uh, items, which was power distribution on Exmoor. And I was interested to hear that Western Power is now being taken over by National Grid all one big company, or going to be all one big company, but they did um, give us a lot of information all about the distribution of power across Exmoor, and all the work they've done in cutting trees down to make the supply more resilient, which was quite interesting. Um, another presentation was on sustainable energy by Darren Edwards, and um, although I was a little bit concerned that it was going to be a bit more commercial presentation than what uh, we ought to have at these sort of meetings, but he was quite good. He he, he did try to blow, his, blow their own trumpet, uh, the work of Fisher German, the company that he worked for, but it was still quite interesting and quite relevant to what's going on nowadays with the cost of electric going through the roof and um, the need to promote other forms of electrical generation like solar and wind power. And um, I think he challenged Dean once or twice on uh, the fact that they obviously promote vast Solar, uh, solar panel sites and wind turbines, which I don't think many of us would agree would be nice for the National Park. And another presentation was all about um, the rural housing on Exmoor and the new rural housing enabler, which is Colin MacDonald. I only hope, my only hope, is that he stays in post longer than the last one because we need that continuity and um, we need to do something desperately about affordable housing on Exmoor. I've very often said um, in the past about the problems with affordable housing in our village, Exford for example. Um, 
and there are moves afoot now to try to get um, affordable housing a bit more higher on the agenda of all the people that matter um, and um, it was with that in mind it was very interesting to have the presentation by a fellow member here Jeremy um, about what's going on in Paracan and the land trust and it's something that we are looking at on Exmoor now or on Exford uh, to try to push that ahead so um, yeah a, a very good meeting the super fast broadband rollout that was mentioned in the agenda was postponed until the following meeting which is on uh, Thursday 17th of November here in uh, Exmoor House which um, I hope a lot more people will be able to find easier than what they did <laughs> <laughs> in the Paragon Village Hall. Um, so, um, yeah, good meeting. Not quite as well attended as what one would like to see, but um, some interesting questions to the speakers and um, look forward to seeing everyone or as, as many as possible at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any questions, comments? Linda. Um, I don't, <coughs> I very rarely attend the parish forum because I'm so committed with a lot of the partnership groups. Um, but in view of what's been said earlier, so for example, um, the item <coughs> on finance, Gordon's item about the focus of the National Park, a renewed focus on conservation, and engagement. In view of what we said about the conference, or what I said about the conference, actually getting that vibe about the excitement of what we do as our core work into the local community. And then looking at the agenda of the Exmoor Forum, where we're talking about non-core work, and it's, I believe, led by the people that turn up, they submit items for the agendas. It seems to me we're getting a diversion on the way that the authority can afford to go and needs to go and where the community is asking us to go. And I think we have something to address there. Um, you know, even looking at the items coming up, future, it does seem to be away from our core work. And I think that's something that we've clearly got to look at. Thank you, Linda. I think... I was just looking through the items that were there, and I think, yes, you're right, it, that it's not the core bit. What it is addressed, really, to some extent, all of these are addressed against the planning function that we do, really, because whether, whether it be the power distribution, the sustainable energy stuff, or the housing, that all comes against, against to some extent, our planning function. I think we've got to be clear that that is where our interest lies in it is as a planning authority not as that enabler of those functions and that is a very different scenario so absolutely agree Linda I think we need to make sure that we're really clear and I think there are going to be some challenges there against that planning function because with energy prices where they are we're going to get more and more people looking at different ways of energy and, uh, and whether whether looking at power distribution or sustainable energy, that uh, whether we're going to see more wind turbines or solar panels or or whatever applied for in the near future is going to um, may, may challenge some of the planning team quite substantively, I feel. Eric? Yeah, uh, just a comment, and this is not aimed at criticism of the chairman, but the amount that was... Um, contained in that meeting was probably a bit too much for one evening because there was very little time for any questions but but the main thing uh, the sustainable energy guy and the ha new housing enabler I think there might be merit in them to those two actually come into an authority meeting 
and, and give a presentation as they did that night. It's only a suggestion. If, if you're short of items for one uh, meeting, um, it's only a thought. No, thanks, Harry. John? Well, I'm, I've got to disagree with Eric on this one. Not because they aren't interesting items, but having just considered Gordon's paper on the budget and the financial situation we're in and the need to focus on exactly what we're doing, um, the and I've got to disagree with the chair. Oh my gosh! I'll never speak again. Will I? <laughs> <laughs> Using the catch-all of the fact that there's uh, construction involved and therefore it's the planning function is really a bit of a way to expand our our role into anything we really want it to. And if we're serious about being able to make ends meet, we need to be able to focus on our core activities, as we discussed earlier, rather, as Linda described, rather than um, talk about interesting stuff that is peripheral, even though it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, briefly, then Andrea, then no, Dominic. You know, attending one or two of the Exmoor Young Voices um, meetings, for them to hear what John's just said, they would not be impressed. You know, to I them, having a roof over the head is... I think, I think in a minute we'll have a bit of a discussion on this. In a minute ah, before, okay. In a minute. Um, Andrea? Chairman, I'm, well, we have the chairman of, of this uh, sat here, so I would hope that in his emerging issues, he might like to have the first item of his next meeting is about those key principles that we've yeah. already discussed. Yeah. And let's remember, this is also a cost of the authority, this meeting, yeah. so therefore it also has to reflect what the authority does. So we have to do it in every activity, not just the ones we pick and choose to do. Thanks, Andrea. Dominic. Uh, one of our core principles, of course, is related to our climate emergency, and I'm concerned about, uh, about visitors to your meetings uh, driving around the countryside and the wilds of Paracum trying to find <laughs> the village hall, which I'd say e even I can find. Uh, and um, uh, if I, a small tip I can make, which is to suggest that you, uh, I mean, obviously, for here won't be an issue, but if you're going to use another venue that not everyone's familiar with, is to use the What Three Words app, um, which will identify every uh, 10 square meters in the country by three unique words. It is an app that anybody can install on their smartphone. And also, it's actually worth mentioning this to people because they can also use it, for instance, to direct contractors, if they're a farmer, um, to actually go to the right field, as I discovered this year when uh, A and B contractors um, mowed the wrong field and then bailed the wrong field. Um, for in future, apparently, you can actually give the tractor driver the what three words identify for them, and it will actually identify a particular farm gate. It's that specific. Um, so that is something that I would, uh, I would put out there um, as a tip. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. We have uh, it's a recommendation to note, or, or not a recommendation, but that, that was that was minutes to note for the start of this afternoon. Yeah. Is it that we received it? Receive a note. Yeah, thank meeting, you. We have then. Meeting, meeting notes of the Exmoor Consultant and Parish Forum. Move to item 12. There are listed three starters there on, on fixed term contracts. Missy Burns, Jan Penny and Philip Wright, as you can see. Um, Joe White, as recorded as leaving, obviously has been with us for a good many years, Joe has, as Principal Planning Officer, and uh, really disappointing to lose him. He will be missed there, no doubt. I'd like to record a thanks for all his time that he spent with us there, actually, because uh, his contribution has been quite considerable over the years. Yes. 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 Yep. We'll do that. End of seasonal contracts. I have three there. Lisa Clark, Peter Haddock, and Shelley Trace as information advisors. Item 13. I have not been notified of any other business of urgency. So at that point, we can close the authority meeting and we will resume with the planning meeting at 1.30, isn't it, yeah. Stephen? Thank you very much.